I sometimes find myself aggravated at the dissemination and misrepresentation of the field of psychology in order to support ideological agendas. Recently, a subscriber shared this video with me on Twitter, and I believe that it encapsulates a great deal of what invokes that aggravation. So let's meet Alan Schliemann from Stand to Reason. Okay, today's challenge is this. When did you choose your heterosexuality? Now you might be asking, well, how is that a challenge? Well, here's how they think that this challenge goes. They think your answer is going to be, well, I didn't choose to be heterosexual. I didn't choose my heterosexuality. I just, ever since I can remember, always felt attracted to the opposite sex. I, I don't think I ever chose that. And so they're thinking, well, therefore, in the same way a homosexual also did not choose his homosexuality. And so since therefore he didn't choose it, he must have been born that way. And if he's born that way, then therefore you can't say that homosexuality is wrong. That's, in essence, what the challenge is here. So, does Alan give us an honest answer to this question? Or instead, does he engage in the type of rhetoric and misinformation I just referred to? Let's take a closer look. Hi, I am Shannon Q. Today we are going to have a look at an apologist who seems to be giving a masterclass in obfuscation and misrepresentation regarding psychiatric and psychological research in general, and specifically as it pertains to sexual orientation. Alan Schliemann is from Stand to Reason. Alan is a former physiotherapist who is now a professional apologetic speaker working with Stand to Reason. The question being posed to Alan regards the idea of sexual orientation being a choice that one actively makes. In lieu of addressing the question, Alan proceeds to engage in a six minute long diatribe of misrepresentation, obfuscation, and historical inaccuracy. This form of misdirection, by virtue of critiquing the validity of the question itself being posed, is seemingly a clever tactic to avoid the obvious answer. This is a common strategy utilized when answering the question itself in an honest and direct fashion will either expose your bias or undermine the strength of your position. Instead of acknowledging the dichotomy of choice versus involuntary natural disposition, Alan redefines the term of the choice component of the question to exclusively mean prenatal genetic disposition, thus creating a false dichotomy to attack as a straw man. We can see this here. And it presumes that the answers are either you're born that way or you choose to be that way. But of course, those are not the only options. Sure, there are some situations, there are some characteristics that we, we get because we are born a certain way. Uh, there are some characteristics that we develop because we choose uh, to behave in a certain way. But there are still some other characteristics that are a result of developmental factors. And indeed, this is the case with same-sex attraction. It's not just you're either born that way or you choose to be gay, but in reality there's a third option and that is that homosexuality is actually a developmental condition. It's something that develops between birth and young adulthood. Now, if it's a developmental condition, then uh, this explains why many homosexuals will always report to you with something like, look, Ever since I can remember, I always, feel, I always felt like I was a little bit different than other people. I always felt attracted not to the opposite sex, but to the same sex. Or I always felt different, if they're a homosexual male, I always felt different than some of the other boys in the way they behaved. And because homosexual attractions are something that begins to develop at a very young age, between the ages of like one and five years old, it's often the case that they don't remember what perhaps were some of the causes that led up to that. And that's why by the time they reach the age of five or six and they start to remember their childhood, they think, oh man, I just feel like I always have been this way. It wasn't because they were born that way, it was rather because something happened that caused them to develop these feelings the way they are. The preceding statement from Alan has a multitude of statements designed to artificially redirect the impetus of the original question to a differing line of thought. What is immediately obvious is the issue that when you redefine the dichotomy of choice to only be perceived as a prenatal genetic determination, it allows you to propose that there are postnatal influences that may have an effect without addressing that even if this is the case, it still would not be voluntary, and thus still falls under the dichotomy proposed in the original question. 
Now, instead of having to answer the question as it was originally posed, he is free to pivot into a differing line of discourse that allows him to dismiss the question itself and instead utilize it as a platform for proselytization. It's a dishonest tactic. However, I should thank him because what follows has afforded me the opportunity to succinctly address an unfortunate trend of misrepresentation that I've witnessed. In this instance, Alan asserts that instead of being genetically innate, sexual orientation is a developmental condition. In order to address this, we should take a look at what exactly a developmental condition or disorder actually is. Developmental disorders are classified in the ICD-10 as conditions that manifest themselves during childhood development and involve impairment in neurological, social, linguistic, and learning development. They are not exclusively or even most likely environmental in origin. Many have a strong genetic aspect. The list includes autism spectrum disorder, childhood onset schizophrenia, and a series of non-neurotypical classifications that have an impact on function and information assimilation. For a multitude of well-documented reasons, sexual orientation does not remotely fit this classification by virtue of its definition. But we will be getting into the importance and the misuse of nomenclature later. What is important here is an understanding of what this misdirection and misrepresentation allows Alan the opportunity to do. Knowing that it's unlikely that the average person would understand the clinical designations surrounding developmental conditions, Alan is free to overlay the inference of disorder with general childhood developmental manifestation. And this ignores an important component of development that allows for natural variation within children. There is no one path of childhood development that all human children neatly adhere to. Sexual propensity doesn't manifest at birth for heterosexual children either. It would thus reasonably be expected that any child, regardless of orientation, would manifest their preferences at A, a time when they are now able to articulate and communicate them, and B, at the time they first become aware of their existence. Allen utilizes this fact of developmental stages to imply instead that their mere presence is evidence of external influence. Now, if it's a developmental condition, then uh, this explains why many homosexuals will always report to you with something like, look, ever since I can remember, I always, feel, I always felt like I was a little bit different than other people. I always felt attracted not to the opposite sex, but to the same sex. Or I always felt different if they're a homosexual male. I always felt different than some of the other boys in the way they behaved. And because homosexual attractions are something that begins to develop at a very young age, between the ages of like one and five years old, it's often the case that they don't remember what perhaps were some of the causes that led up to that. And that's why by the time they reach the age of five or six and they start to remember their childhood, they think, oh man, I just feel like I always have been this way. You can see that Alan is purposefully conflating the natural developmental manifestation of attraction with a developmental condition to make his point. By the same token, would you argue that a child not identifying heterosexual inclinations until they became aware of their manifestation has a developmental condition? Of course not. But a heterosexual and homosexual child would invariably have similar self-reports when they became consciously aware of their existence. Allen also utilizes an unsupported age range for this manifestation. Most children do not begin to become aware of attraction until between the ages of 6 and 10, but this can vary. There is no predictive or exclusive explanatory power in the statement that because children do not become aware of their orientation regarding attraction until a specific age, thus we can deduce that it's a developmental or external influence that leads to those inclinations. It certainly doesn't exclude the possibility, but it can't and doesn't imply it as the cause. No child is aware of their orientation until they reach an age of sexual awareness. It's evidence of nothing at all, but it's being used as an opportunity here to make an unfounded assertion. By the definition that Alan is using here, language acquisition, external familial relationship formation, aptitude for logical and predictive cognition, and preferences for hobbies are all developmental conditions, simply because they emerge as a child follows their natural developmental trajectory. Alan goes on to make a vastly incorrect assertion to support these inferences. Now this developmental pathway is not something that we develop today. Rather, scientists have known for over a hundred years that homosexual attraction, same-sex attraction, is something that develops. 
okay? Scientists, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, and other researchers have been looking at this for a long time and have had actually a fairly good understanding of what causes same-sex attraction. Now, I cannot state strongly enough that there is absolutely no definitive consensus regarding the cause of sexual orientation. None. However, what we do have is an increasing body of work that indicates that there is very likely a genetic component involved. Work in the fields of genetics, psychiatry, psychology, and biology all seem to currently coalesce on a hypothesis of phenotypic manifestation that indicates the presence of innate genetic factors. No one has conclusively eliminated or proved environmental influence on that manifestation. Some research worth reading in this area regards sibling and twin studies. For example, families with multiple children are statistically more likely to have more than one homosexual sibling if they have one at all, regardless of whether they were raised in the same household. This eliminates similar upbringing as a factor and points towards genetic predisposition. There are also a series of neurological studies showing uniformity in bihemisphere cortical structures in heterosexual women and homosexual males. I've linked a few in the description if you would like to peruse them. This isn't to say that there is anything conclusive in any existing field regarding the origin of sexual orientations. The answer could very well be multivariate. Currently, we just don't know. What I can say with absolute confidence is this. There is not over a hundred years of empirical research indicating specificity of developmental influences as the cause that any field is ignoring. That is simply an abject falsehood being presented to support your ideological position, Alan. And Alan, what you are about to say next. Oh, oh Alan. The problem is, is that in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association decided that they will remove homosexuality from their, um, from their encyclopedia of, that lists all of the mental disorders that they normally diagnose. And so as a result of that, homosexuality was no longer viewed as a mental condition, something that needs to be treated. And at that point, and by the way, um, that decision was not made because there was some new scientific discovery that repudiated a hundred years of research. It wasn't like they found a gay gene. It wasn't that there was a new study that said, oh, well, homosexuality isn't a developmental condition. It's something that you're born with. No, there's nothing like that. Rather, it was voted on as a result of political pressure and political correctness. Okay, everybody. We're about to have a little history lesson. I am becoming incredibly tired of the argument that the APA removed homosexuality from the DSM-2 in 1973, which is not an encyclopedia, by the way, Alan, solely due to political influence. So if you'll all indulge me for a moment, let's take a look at what really happened. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is put up by the American Psychiatric Association in order to be utilized by clinicians and medical professionals to help both identify and eliminate diagnoses of mental disorders. The very first DSM was published in 1952, and it included homosexuality in its list of diagnosable and recognized mental health disorders. Now, there are a multitude of reasons for this. At the time of the publishing of the original DSM, the fields of applied psychology and psychiatry were very young. In fact, the modern applied field arguably didn't really start to become established within the sciences until the establishment of the first laboratory of psychology by Wilhelm Wundt in 1879. After Wundt, the zeitgeist of psychology was leaning towards that of psychoanalysis led by the influence of Freud. Now, Freud was a major influence in demonstrating the practical applications of the field. However, his methodologies are viewed today as antiquated, ineffective, and they're of no particular modern application. What he was, however, was a catalyst that would help to ultimately propel the field towards empiricism. At the time, most of the body of psychology research was deduced by way of subjective interpretation of the case studies without the controls affiliated with more contemporary forms of empirical study in the field. Now, why is this history important? It's important for two reasons. 
One, it tells us that the lion's share of the information that was utilized to assign homosexuality the designation of a mental disorder was derived from case studies of people who had either sought psychological assistance or more than likely had been checked into a psychological facility for attempted conversion. And two, this adds a massive sampling bias to the already problematic fact that very little unbiased empirical analysis, but rather subjective interpretation of these biased samples is what led to its inclusion to begin with. Freud himself, in fact, didn't see homosexuality as a mental issue at all, but rather a natural variation of sexual orientation. However, after he died, his contemporaries very admittedly applied their Judeo-Christian views of morality to the case study interpretations. So when we have case studies only of patients who report mental conflict or who have been admitted for conversion that are then being interpreted through a predetermination of their behavior itself constituting an enactment of immorality with no external controls, of course it's included as a mental disorder. As of this recording, the DSM is in its fifth iteration. The DSM-2 was originally published in 1968. At the APA conference in 1970, there was a protest on the heels of the Stonewall riots in 1969. Gay activists disrupted the conference in order to ask that the inclusion of homosexuality as a mental disorder be reevaluated, but no such reevaluation took place at that time. In 1971 and 1972, what did take place instead were panel discussions, where gay rights activists were permitted to make presentations regarding the case for removal. The stigma regarding homosexuality was still in fact so strong that when Dr. John Fryer made his presentation at the 1972 conference, he wore a disguise and referred to himself as Dr. H. Anonymous to avoid career suicide. It was not until 1973 when Dr. Robert L. Spitzer, who was the head of the Nomenclature Task Force, drafted a proposal clearly outlining why homosexuality did not meet the committee's actual definition of a mental disorder, that it was removed. And it was not an arbitrary decision. On the contrary, in the years since the original inclusion, the field had become more scientifically empirical and there were a few key studies that, in fact, contravened the previously held position that homosexuality was both a choice and that it was inherently detrimental to the individual. The first and most well-known are the Kinsey reports, published by Alfred Kinsey. These were broad-reaching surveys of thousands of non-patient participants regarding sexual propensity. This report brought to light and public attention the fact that the view of sexuality as a linear was false. Instead, sexuality clearly existed on a spectrum that permeated cultures. Further studies in the field of biology indicated that homosexuality was present in every observed animal population. This moved the theories of affect away from choice pathology and into the realm of normal variation within a natural population. Perhaps the most important work predating the 1973 decision was that of Evelyn Hooker. In 1957, Evelyn took 60 random male subjects, 30 gay and 30 straight. She administered three separate projective tests on all 60 men independently, the Rorschach, Thematic Apperception Test, and Make a Picture Story Test. She then asked leading experts in the field to review the results without knowing who took the tests. The experts found no difference of any significance whatsoever in the psychopathology between the groups. And in fact, although prior to their analysis, many attested that they would clearly know the difference, all were surprised by their absolute inability to differentiate the participant groups. This brings us back to the importance of nomenclature. What does a mental disorder have to be in order for it to qualify for entry into the DSM? Here is your answer. In the proposal that you see on the screen, submitted by Dr. Spitzer in 1973, on page two, we finally see our definition. According to the established nomenclature, in order for something to be considered a mental disorder, it must either regularly cause subjective distress or regularly be associated with some generalized impairment in social effectiveness or functioning. Homosexual orientations had been demonstrated to have no influence on cognitive or social function or intellectual aptitude and generated no perceivable impairment. The research demonstrated it, so it had to be removed. 
In actual fact, the political and cultural climate was still so against the removal that the APA did not remove the classification of homosexuality fully, rather just homosexuality per se. In the 1973 DSM-2 amendment, instead they changed it to sexual orientation disorder. Homosexuality was still considered a mental disorder if a person for any reason professed an inclination to change orientations, regardless of the reason that change was desired. It was further reclassified as sexual dystonic homosexuality in the DSM-3, and in fact, it was not fully removed until 1987. That, my friends, is the actual history of homosexuality in the DSM. There are corroborating sources in the description, so the next time somebody tells you that the only reason homosexuality isn't considered a mental disorder is because a group of gay activists persuaded the APA to arbitrarily remove it, feel free to direct them here. Everything is cited in the description, and I am just about sick of hearing it. Your justification for making that argument is an ill-informed attempt at representing homosexuality as a mental disorder, when it is very clearly not by any established metric. Take a look at the research and the history, and then take a look at yourself. Sorry for the diversion. Let's get back to Alan. I'm certain he has more to say on the topic. So what happened after 1973 was... Uh, scientists refer to it as the big chill. This is a period of time since 1973 where researchers, therapists, psychologists, physicians are no longer allowed to pursue research about the causes, the developmental causes of same-sex attraction. I mean, sure, they can pursue them, but they are intimidated about it, they are pressured against it, and if they try to get research published, consistent with those conclusions, and they have a hard time doing it. Alan does something particularly interesting here that I am sure you all caught. Alan says that researchers can't study the origins of sexual orientation, then says that they can, then qualifies it by asserting that there is a political pressure to publish findings in accordance to a predetermined conclusion. Again, this is just flatly false. There are researchers actively studying multiple aspects of potential causes for sexual orientation as we speak. What Ellen seems to be hoping to establish here is an inference that researchers are only permitted to focus on genetic disposition, which is not at all the case. The fact is currently there is a large breadth of interesting results coming from studies that focus on genetic factors. This may incline researchers to choose this as an area of focus, but other avenues certainly are not closed. It's simply an assertion. One that's designed to give a listener the impression that there is some sort of agenda shrouding the study of sexual orientation. This allows him and those who subscribe to his perspective the ability to feel as though they can dismiss legitimate research as suspect and ideological without any unbiased scrutiny of the empirical results. It taints the perspective people have on the field, poisons the well in order to support his narrative without him having to present any relevant research or empirical data of his own. So what authorities in the field would Alan appeal to in order to support his assertion? Now, there are actually a lot of researchers today who continue to pursue research le looking into the developmental causes of same-sex attraction. And by the way, these aren't Christian researchers or pastors or something like this. We're talking about secular scientists. Indeed, even gay researchers, people who identify themselves as gay or lesbian, many of them have also come to the same conclusion simply based on the fact that we've known for over 100 years these are the developmental causes of same-sex attraction. I'm thinking of people like uh, Camille Paglia and Dr. Martin Duberman, both of whom identify as gay themselves. And some of them say simply, look, homosexuality and the development of same-sex attraction is not an inborn trait, it's an adaptation. Alan mentions two researchers in the field who support his claims via empirical analysis and research, Camille Paglia and Dr. Martin Duberman, researchers who in fact identify as homosexual themselves. This intrigued me, so I went looking for their research in order to review their findings, since Alan purports that it will support his claims. However, I couldn't find any, and there's a really good reason why. This is Camille Paglia. Camille does in fact identify as lesbian, however, she's not a researcher. Camille is a professor of literature and a well-known cultural critic. She does have some controversial theories regarding the development of same-sex attraction, but does not now, nor has she ever, conducted any studies to support her hypothesis. 
And this is Dr. Martin Duberman. Martin is a well-known historian. He has written multiple books on his experience as a homosexual man and in academia and the general culture, but also does not now, nor has he ever, conducted any research regarding the origins of same-sex attraction. So, not only does Alan willfully misrepresent the entire history of the fields of psychology and psychiatry when it comes to the study of sexual orientation here, he blatantly misrepresents the vocations of two well-known academics who speak publicly on the topic perhaps in the hope that no one will fact check his claims and people will simply take for granted he is making an honest presentation of the facts. I've included both of their biographies in the description. Please do not take my honest dream for granted. Validate what I say and advocate for your own understanding. So we've almost reached our conclusion. Does Alan ever actually answer this question? So again, the problem with this challenge is that it perpetuates this false dilemma uh, between you're either born gay or you choose to be gay. And of course, not only is this uh, not the only possible option for what causes same-sex attraction, but it ignores a century of science. And it ignores a century of science for the purpose of being politically correct. And of course, when scientific facts have to, have to cave to political pressure, then it doesn't really matter what the science says. It doesn't matter what the facts are. We just kind of follow what's politically correct. And that, unfortunately, is what's happened with the cause or with the, with the question about what causes same-sex attraction. No. No, he doesn't. He redefines it, misrepresents the information regarding it, and rewrites history to avoid it. One has to wonder why. What does it mean to you if sexual orientation isn't a choice, Alan? How about I answer the question for you? No, it isn't. And even if it were, it's none of your goddamn business. Hi, as always, thank you so much for watching. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of your support. And a special thank you to everybody who supports the channel through Patreon and PayPal. If you would like to support the channel, there's always links in the description. There's always also links to my Twitter and my Discord, as well as my new Facebook account. If you'd like to follow me there, please do. I can't wait to hear from you. And as always, help elevate the discourse. <laughs>